In this episode of Influencers, Marty Walsh, U.S. Secretary of Labor. The biggest question we have is getting people back to work in the labor market. I mean, lots of jobs still open in the country. Uh, so we have some work to do here at the Department of Labor. It's no secret I'm a union guy. I have, yeah. I have a union book in my pocket, but I represent all workers in America. What's happening is we're still living in COVID. We still, we're still living in a pandemic, and, and the pandemic's not gone. So there's still fear out there. Everyone and welcome to Influencers. I'm Andy Serwer, and welcome to our guest, U.S. Labor Secretary Martin Walsh. We're here in front of the Labor Department in Washington, D.C. Thank you very much for having us, Secretary Walsh. Thanks for having me today on this nice, cool day in Washington. It is a bit brisk, but you're used to that being from Boston, right? Yeah, not too bad. Yeah, it's a lot colder in Boston today. That's right. Um, so I want to jump right in and ask you about the labor market. Uh, jobs report the other day, a little bit weaker than expected in terms of creation, but the unemployment rate below 4%. That's good news. But I want to ask you what you're most concerned about when it comes to the labor market in the United States right now. Well, I think obviously the biggest question we have is getting people back to work in the labor market. I mean, lots of jobs still open in the country. Uh, so we have some work to do here at the Department of Labor in, in working about retraining workers uh, in, in new skills for new opportunities that they left their previous job for. They haven't gone back to a job. I think that that's one thing that we have to do a better job of. And that, that meaning by that, when I say better job, it's not just the federal government. It's working with states and cities to create opportunities. You know, I'm a former mayor, so we did a lot of job training in the city of Boston, and I did a lot of work of attracting new companies to Boston because we had a workforce there that, that could, could do the job. So I think in the, we're in a very different situation right now. This isn't about attracting new companies and filling those jobs. This is about filling jobs that remain open. So 2022, that's going to be, we've done in 2021, but 2022, the president has tasked us with that priority of making sure that we get as much job training out there uh, that's going to get real impact and get people back to work. What about black Americans, though, Secretary Walsh? The numbers were a little bit weaker uh, there for that particular group. Is that a concern for you? Yeah, we have to be a lot more intentional when it comes to black Americans. Historically, uh, the, the, the unemployment rate for black Americans is often double that of white Americans. But if you dive even deeper in some of the jobs that black Americans have, they're not high paying jobs. So we have to create better pathways. And I think that we have to do, you know, myself and I've been partnering with Secretary Godona from Education and Secretary Raimondo from Commerce and working to how do we create better pathways, whether it's out of high school, into community college, college, working with businesses, working with labor, moving forward. So we have to do, uh, we have to be more intentional about our work there. Some places have done a really good job of it. Uh, down in Atlanta has done some good work on it, but there's not enough of those stories around America yet. Another area, just to dive in a little bit into the, the market, is uh, restaurants, leisure, and that sector of the economy, which has just been whipsawed, obviously, by COVID. Are there steps you can take there? Well, it's a little different. I mean, we, we, we did see some of the largest gains in employment in those areas, but there's still a lot of openings in those areas. And, and I think that the, the issue of, of rest, what restaurants have, it goes a lot deeper than just hiring. It goes with the COVID implications, uh, with, with shutting down, having to go to takeout, having a remote, having to build barriers in their restaurants. So, you know, again, a lot of restaurants have done, uh, people have said to me in the beginning of the pandemic when I started this job here as Secretary of Labor, that the unemployment benefit was keeping people from going to work. And quite honestly, when the unemployment benefit expired, people still didn't go back in some of those industries. So again, I think those industries are reimagining how do they hire people? How do they get more people engaged in coming into work in those places? And, and I do feel that they will come back. The pandemic, you know, we, we have these conversations all day long about what do you think is going on in the economy? What's happening? Um, what's happening is we're still living in COVID. We still, we're still living in a pandemic and, and the pandemic's not gone. So there's still fear out there. There's still lack of childcare out there. There's still concern about people going, working in the, with the public. So to, to all those challenges we move forward here, as we get more people vaccinated and, and we do a better job of testing, I think more people feel comfortable going back to work. Another facet of the economy that has caught a lot of people's attention lately is inflation. And we just saw that record number come out, or 40-year high, I should say, 7% the other day. And I'm wondering how that's impacting 
the labor market? Well, certainly when you think about that number that came out the other day, it's, it's not something that I want to talk about. We want to see it go the other way and see more people going to work. But I think we have to look at it through the lens of the whole picture. And when you look at what's happened in 2021 with President Biden after he took over, uh, putting out the, the vaccines, getting getting Americans vaccinated, seven, uh, 81 percent, I think, of all adults are vaccinated now in our country, uh, 6.2 million new jobs, 3.9 percent unemployment number, uh, 84 percent of the industries that were affected by the pandemic, gone, people gone back to work. We're seeing lows in, 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 in uh, highs in job creation and lows in, in unemployment benefits or the, or the biggest decreases. So th those are all positive signs. And then we also have to do some more work. We have to make sure we continue through President Biden's economic plan to, to work on the issues of, of lowering inflation, bringing it forward. The experts and, and the economists are saying by the end of the year, we'll see that number tr start to go the other way, which is a good sign, but that doesn't help any on today. So the president is making sure that the impacts that he has are going to have a big impact at the kitchen table. And you mentioned vaccines, and I want to talk about the vaccine mandate, of course, and ask you about enforcement, obviously still in front of the Supreme Court. But where do things stand in terms of the administration enforcing that with the companies right now? Well, I don't think you have to force with companies. I think most companies have stepped up. But it is ultimately, it's going to be the responsibility of employers making sure their employees are safe, uh, making sure that the workplace is safe, making sure they have the proper PPE and, 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 and social distancing, if you will, inside the, the, their establishments. A little, little trickier when it comes to production lines and things like that with people working in close, tight quarters. But I think at the end of the day, regardless of what, and I'm hopeful, I'm hopeful the Supreme Court will um, will be able will rule in, 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 in favor of the Department of Labor. You know, medical experts have said that this is the right thing to do. Uh, people have said this is the right way to go. We should be doing this. Many companies support us. Uh, but it, even, even with or without what the ETS is, it's still going to be the responsibility to work with employers to make sure their workplace is safe for their workers. I mean, do you have a plan if the Supreme Court strikes it down? Well, I mean, the plan is that we're going to be asking employers to continue to make sure their workplace is safe. I mean, we're doing that before. And I think that, you know, I've, I've spent the last uh, couple of weeks here talking to some of the largest employers in the country. Uh, and, you know, we talked about vaccine pro programs they have. All of these companies have programs set up in them already. Uh, so, so they've already thought about this. They've thought about this from probably mid-2020 through today to make sure they, they, they create a safe space for their employees, number one, to keep them safe, but also number two, to create an environment that people want to come back to work. But Secretary Walsh, aren't there problems with enforcement given the shortages of test kits? And what is the administration doing there to make that happen? Well, obviously, there's, there's issues around right now in supply getting more test kits made. And the, the ETS, uh, if it's passed or it's in effect now, but if the Supreme Court rules in favor of the Department of Labor, uh, the testing is going to be for those that are unvaccinated. So that's a lot smaller number than people that are vaccinated. I want to shift gears and ask about some um, labor negotiations and, and strikes around the country. Um, in March, there was a union drive at an Amazon warehouse in Alabama, and President Biden called for no intimidation. The federal agency has found that Amazon did legally intimidate workers during the union drive. Are you disappointed that Amazon defied the president's words? Well, there's going to be another. There's going to be another vote there. I think. They, I don't know if the date is set yet, but I saw that the other day. There's going to be another vote there uh, in that. So there'll be an opportunity for the employees to see if they want to unionize there. Uh, certainly, the president's feel and my feeling is everyone has the right to organize, uh, and it, they should be able to organize without any interference. And I think that that's for any company in America. Same with Starbucks. There's a lot more unionization going on with those stores. Does that surprise you? Uh, not really. You know, when you look at when you look at the numbers, the, the, what surprised me is the polling numbers. Seventy percent of millennials uh, feel they look for support, look very favorably upon unions. And when I say surprise, I'm happy to see that. I grew up in a labor family, and as a kid, uh, you know, not everyone had the same feeling in my family, my father, and myself, my uncle, and my my brother, and, and cousins who felt that way. So it's good to see that there there is definitely a, an interest in, in uni unionization again. Unions bring opportunities for people in this country they otherwise wouldn't have. The power of collective bargaining, the power of, of fighting for raising their wages, the power of pensions, the power of other kind of pension plans, 401ks. So I think that there's opportunities here for us to rebuild the middle class by that. And, and certainly I, I, I support collective bargaining and I support unionization, but I also support it being done the right way. So if people want to organize, they should be able to organize. And if people choose not to organize, they should have that right as well. That's interesting, because I'm wondering, is the Labor Department, where does the Labor Department stand technically with unionization? I mean, are they 
pro-union? Are they certainly not anti-union, I would imagine, but are they neutral? And is it their job to foster unionization in this country? Well, listen, it's, it's no secret I'm a union guy. I have, yeah. a, I have a union book in my pocket, but I represent all workers in America. So I represent those workers that are covered by collective bargaining and that belong to a union, and I represent those workers that don't belong to a union. And, and I, I, don't, I don't represent another one differently than the other one. So it's very important for me to make sure, and we all do that in, in this in the department. We have 18,000 employees in the Department of Labor, actually less than that right now. We're hiring up under the past administration. A lot of different departments got hit pretty well, but we represent all workers. Yeah, there are job shortages here at the Department of Labor. It's a right different now. reason for the job <laughs> shortage okay, here, though. Right. We, right. didn't, we didn't fill the spots over the last four years that should have been filled in worker protection, safety, MSHA, OSHA, and other places. I saw a post office the other day had a job, you know, employees wanted. I mean, I haven't seen that in a long time at a post office. It used to be a well sought after job. Right. I think it still is. I mean, right. good benefits and things like that. But I th again, I think that this pandemic, you know, I think we all, I don't know if it happened to you, it happened to me, we had opportunities to, to have a lot of downtime thinking about, you know, I was the mayor of Boston when it began, and, you know, I, I went to work every day, but I'd be home at five o'clock. That never happens as mayor. And you'd have a lot of time to think about where you are in society, where you are in your job. And I think a lot of people took that time and had a lot of good quality family time saying, wait a second, I want something different. Let me ask you about Proposition 22 in California, um, which is a, a really interesting and critical issue about gig workers and whether or not they're employees. Where do things stand with that? Well, you know, what we're focused on here is on misclassification of employees right now, looking at uh, who's being misclassified uh, and, and the, the, the severity of misclassification. Uh, when people are misclassified, they lose out on wages, they lose out on benefits, they lose out on protections, they lo lose out on a whole bunch of different things. And, you know, some of those misclassification that we look at are people like dishwashers. Everyone thinks of Uber and Lyft as gig working, but some of it's also misclassification of dishwashers in restaurants. So, uh, we, we, you know, we're working through a process here. Here, and we're looking at making sure that, that workers have their rights, that the rights that, that, that are owed to them. In October, you visited striking Kellogg's workers. And I'm wondering, how do you make the decision when to visit uh, striking workers or not? Well, I can't invite, I can't visit every strike in place in the country, but generally when I go there, uh, if I go to a strike, it, it's to support workers, but it's also to create an open door pathway. Uh, I'm willing to step into any negotiation, labor negotiation that's needed in this country to solve it. If workers are on the street striking, that means that the problem, the, 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 that's a problem for the company, it's a problem for the workers. The worker doesn't make any money and the, and the company's not, is not producing whatever they produce. So I think that when you get to a strike, it's too late. So I, I think it's important for us to continue the dialogue, stay at the table, even if there's hard feelings, employers and employees should stay at the table and get those negotiations done. In my time as mayor of Boston, I, I intervened on several strikes that were successful. My time as Secretary of Labor, I've intervened on several strikes that have been ended in a, a good way. So I, I do feel that we need to keep those conversations, dialogues going. The Build Back Better bill appears to be dead at this point, and Senator Manchin has uh, effectively blocked it, I think it's fair to say. Um, there are some labor provisions in that bill. Does that strike you that uh, Senator Manchin is anti-labor, therefore? I wouldn't say it's dead. I would say that it might be, it might be on pause a bit, I hope. Uh, no, I, I, would not, I would not say Senator Manchin's anti-labor. I've had many conversations with the senator. Uh, you know, certainly he, he represents the people in the state, in West Virginia. Uh, the miners, in particular, the, they're unionized, that he represents them very tough, very strongly. Uh, but I, I think that there, there, there is, hopefully, dialogue will continue as we get into the new year, a little further into new year. And there's some great provisions in the Build Back Better bill that I'd love to see come into, into existence. Uh, Pre-kindergarten, child care, adult care, job training money, all of those are important for our economy moving, moving forward. Also, it looks difficult to get that $15 minimum wage law uh, passed. Um, I saw that Kroger was paying $25 an hour up in the Midwest. I had a, had a job opening there. What's the, what are the chances yeah, of that ever happening? I, I, I can't understand why somebody is against a $15 an hour minimum wage, uh, a baseline minimum wage for families. Uh, it, it just doesn't make any sense to me. People use the excuse, well, it's going to it's gonna hurt business. It doesn't hurt business. If you look at the states where the minimum wage is $15 an hour or look at the companies that have raised their minimum wage to 15 sometimes 25 18 dollars those companies are raising their wages because they're doing great they're not raising their wages because they're going out of business so in states aren't going out of business and, and losing business because of that so i don't quite understand why um why we don't have a, a 15 dollar an hour federal minimum wage right now in our country 
the Department of Labor did raise the minimum wage for um, federal employees this year. It went into effect January 1st, and I think we'll see some benefits to that, at least for families. You talked earlier, I think to us as a matter of fact, about modernizing unemployment insurance in this country. And I'm wondering where things stand with that effort. Is that something you'd still like to pursue? Oh, we're doing it right now. We have the modernization office here at the Department of Labor uh, in, in the UI system. Uh, we got a $2 billion investment from the American Rescue Plan. Uh, we're working on getting grants out to cities and towns, uh, not cities, out to town, um, states across the country. Uh, very encouraged by both Democratic and Republican-led states uh, are very engaged with the Department of Labor in, in modernizing their system. Speaking of states around the country, I think you visited 30 last year, yeah, 60 yeah, yeah. cities, 30 states. Yeah. What did you learn? Why do you want to do this? And what did you learn? Well, I learned that, you know, the challenges uh, that American workers have are in every state in this country. Uh, I found that, you know, um, it's been great going around to the states because I come from Massachusetts. I come from the Northeast and anyone that knows us, we pretty much stay where we are. Uh, but I've had a chance to go all over the country down to Memphis and, and out to California and to Alabama uh, and different places. And it, it's great to talk to people. What, what I do know, the biggest thing I've seen, and I wouldn't say this is great, but the challenge and struggles people have in America, uh, whether it's around child care or, or any good wages, that's, that's a big problem in our country. One thing people have criticized workers for, if you will, is that they are not moving as much as Americans used to. I don't know whether that's the case or not, but I've heard it anecdotally. In other words, people are sort of stuck in towns that may be depressed and they should move to places where there's more job creation. Do you think that's true? or? I, that's the first I've heard of it, but but I, I definitely think that we should be making investments in those towns that are depressed and bring more jobs to those areas. And I think that's that's the responsibility of, of government to do that, to, to create more opportunities for people in their cities and towns so they can build their towns up, rather than people exit, ex, exit their cities and towns, try and create opportunities in their cities and towns. Secretary Walsh, I want to ask some questions about you personally and growing up and back in Boston, which you talked about. When you were a young child, um, you uh, had a battle with cancer, and I'm wondering how that informed you and in your life and, and your thinking about things. Yeah, when I was seven, I was diagnosed with Burkitt's lymphoma, which is a form of childhood cancer. Adults get it, uh, and I got it in 1974, so the prognosis back then was not as good as it is today, thank God, uh, with, with medicine. Uh, but, you know, as a child, it didn't inform me, but as I got older, I realized that the what my family went through and what I went through made me think a little differently about how I govern, how I lead, uh, and, and really thinking about making sure opportunities. So, for example, in Massachusetts, I was proud to vote for universal health insurance in Massachusetts. Uh, we did it before the, before Obamacare, and it was it was a good vote because I knew that there were there were thousands of families in, in Massachusetts, like the same place my family was in 1974, that didn't have a lot of money and resources, uh, but give, creating opportunities for families today to have health care. You followed uh, your father into the union, and um, I'm wondering what you talked about, but I'm wondering what did you take away from that? What did you what did you get out of that? And what drew you to that, actually, besides just your dad? Well, first and foremost, I shouldn't have dropped out of college to go in the union. My father was dead against it. Uh, but I did drop out. And, and what, what I what I learned was the, 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 the ability for hard work and what it means and, and understanding that, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm fortunate in my life, the opportunities I've had in my life. And my father went to work every day. And, and, and millions of people like my father went to work every day and got dirty and came home and was able to support a family, raise a family, put food on the table. Uh, my father was able to live with dignity when he retired because he had a pension. My father was able to die with dignity because he knew that his pension would be able to go to my mother when he died. So th that, that union gave my family the opportunity for, from the time he came off the plane in Ireland when he joined the union to the day that, that he passed away. And my mother still has that same pension my father had. What's the biggest difference between being the mayor of Boston and the U.S. Labor Secretary? Oh, when you we well, need the mayor, you're the boss, you know. Uh, President Biden's my boss, and and, uh, and uh, well, I'm gonna. President Biden's my boss. I, I work with the guys over there, um, and ladies over there, I should say. Uh, no, it, it's a. Uh, it's a little different. It, you know, it's an executive role being mayor, and, and it's executive slash policy role being Secretary of Labor, and and, and obviously the the, the geographic reach of the Secretary of Labor's job, it's, it's you know, 50 states and, and, and also territories in our country. And also, we also have international labor um, office here at the Department of Labor. So it's a lot deeper reach. 
What about the partisan politics here in, in Washington, Secretary Walsh? Is it different than from Boston, and how have you been able to deal with that? Completely different than when I was in the Massachusetts House of Representatives. Um, you know, many of the Republicans in the, in the House were fr are, fr are friends of mine, and, and, you know, you might have an argument debate on the floor, but when you walked out the door, it wasn't personal. And, and I, I think the partisan stuff here in Washington is a little too much, and I think the American people are being turned off by it. I think that we have to realize that whether you're a Democrat or Republican or an independent, uh, you represent and people, uh, and you represent all the people in your district. They're not just the. If I'm a Democrat. That doesn't mean as Secretary of Labor, I represent just Democrats. I represent everyone in America who's looking for anything from the Department of Labor. That's what I do, and I think we have to think about that more in the country. All right. Speaking of Massachusetts, I have to ask you. It's been reported you've considered running for governor of Massachusetts. Anything to that? Yeah, I haven't considered anything. You know, I, uh, I, I'm the Secretary of Labor. I, you know, I got a call from my governor, Charlie Baker, who I had a very good relationship when I was the mayor of Boston. Uh, he's, he's retiring. I congratulated him on his retirement. And, um, you know, I'm focused on my job as Secretary of Labor. Final question, Secretary Walsh. What do you consider or what would you like to have as your legacy? Oh, God. Uh, Honestly, I'm not a big legacy guy. Uh, I want to make sure the people I work with every day, that their legacy is strong, uh, honestly. And I'd like to see the Patriots win about six more Super Bowls. That actually is probably going to be very difficult right now. They're, they're not looking we'll, that we'll bad. We'll see. We'll see. They're not bad right now. Mac Jones is okay. He's a good quarterback. He's only a rookie. We're in the playoffs. That's all that matters. Right. All right. U.S. Labor Secretary Martin Walsh, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me today. You've been watching Influencers. I'm Andy Serwer. We'll see you next time.